This is MPB News. Hi, this is Ashley Norwood. Thanks for checking out the At Issue podcast. If you like what you hear, please like, rate, or leave a comment. Subscribe to this and other MPB News productions like Mississippi Edition to stay up to date. Don't forget to tell your friends about us, too. You can also watch At Issue on MPB TV Friday nights at 730 or on mpbonline.org. Thanks for listening. And thank you for joining us. I'm Wilson Stribling. Welcome to another edition of At Issue, where we discuss and debate the issues facing the state of Mississippi and how these issues impact you. That issue tonight, a bill passed by the Senate that would allow the state auditor to examine the tax returns of people who receive federal benefits like Medicaid, TANF, or food stamps. Republican Senator Josh Harkins of Flowood authored the bill and is chairman of the Finance Committee. The bill was debated for more than an hour on the Senate floor. Let's take a look. So this will give us a way to determine true eligibility that we currently do not have. Correct. It will verify. It will help verify. So my question would be, if you're going to receive taxpayer funds, why aren't we already doing this? Well, that's what we're here today to do, is to set this up. Thank you. The real money, as we all know, is with people who receive private contracts that involve federal money from these agencies and people who are providers. And it just seems to me that this is just a, this is a punitive measure designed to, to deal with people who are, again, the poorest people in the poorest state in the country when he ought to be, have more authority than he already has to go after the people who are really dealing with the big bucks. He ought to go after wherever he finds it, whether it's on the provider side, whether it's within an agency, or whether it's with a recipient. I mean, the money is the money. I mean, the, it doesn't matter where it comes from. It's tax dollars that are being used to, to fund these programs. And, uh, you know, whether it's a small amount of money or a big amount of money, it's still money being misspent and misappropriated. And are you familiar with the recent uh, issue that some of us have been contacted about, about certain benef Medicaid beneficiaries who were on the program, who, did, who were not eligible to be on the program? Yes, I have. Okay, and that was dealing with certain special needs that actually they were not, uh, by their e um, income, were not actually supposed to be on the program yet receiving benefits. That's what I've, I've been told, yes. Okay, and if this is put into place, that would prevent things like that from happening, correct? Democrat John Horn of Jackson says he spoke with the State Division of Medicaid and was told there is no issue with recipients cheating. During the floor debate, Horn said Medicaid recertifies applicants for compliance every year. He pointed out that there's also a Medicaid fraud division within the agency and another in the state attorney general's office. Horn says he believes the Senate bill punishes the poor in Mississippi. Recipients of the support are not the problem. They're not the ones who are cheating. They're not the ones who are stealing and embezzling. Uh, they are, are basically uh, being, being uh, uh, stigmatized and castigated for being poor. And I don't think that that's fair to them. I think it's misguided uh, as well because we're going to spend all these resources and all of this effort to go after a problem that doesn't exist. This is a measure that the executive branch at the federal level is putting forth. It's, it's again, uh, consistent with the Trump administration's attack on the poor. And so I don't, I don't uh, agree that it's something that's necessary or needed. Uh, it is discretionary. It is, there, there is no requirement for them to do this. It is not a statutory requirement uh, that was uh, ordered by Congress. And Congress is the one that makes the laws in the state. The president is doing an overreach. And, and he's doing it because uh, his policies uh, seem to indicate that we, we need to go after the poor as, as much as possible. And, and so I don't agree with it, and I think that, that it is very much unneeded and an overreach. During the floor debate, there were many references to the recent $4 million TANF embezzlement case involving the former director of the Department of Human Services, a staff member, and others who received funds through the agency. Republican Senator Josh Harkins says fraud and mismanagement on any level are a concern and that the auditor must comply with federal guidelines. There is fraud 
uh, apparently on every level, and I'm all for rooting out all of it, whether it's on the provider side, whether it's at the agency, or whether it's on the recipient. Um, there's still tax dollars. These aren't, this isn't federal government money, this is tax dollar money that's being utilized. So if there's one person that's on it that shouldn't be on it, they shouldn't be. Um, it preserves the program for those that need it. And so I would argue and say that, you know, we should root out uh, any waste or abuse wherever it, it resides, whether it's with the recipients, whether it's with the providers, or whether it's mismanagement within the agency. And I think what this, what this audit's gonna do is it's gonna look and make sure that they are uh, determining properly those Medicaid categories that are available for our, our citizens to qualify for. Um, back in, I think it was 2010, the HHS Inspector General started doing some audits and found over $280 million of improper payments to ineligible participants in Medicaid. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure, if anything, it'll be, a, a, it'll be kind of a notice that, hey, you're doing it right. There really wasn't much fraud here. And that's great. I mean, I hope that's what they find. But at the end of the day, this is a directive from the feds that send down over $5 billion to fund Medicaid in Mississippi. So if they want to audit their funds, I mean, that's, that's their prerogative. And the auditor is just seeking the ability to use those tax returns to match with the, they're not auditing any tax returns. They're just looking at them to match with the applications that were made at the Division of Medicaid. The measure passed 34 to 15 along party lines. It now heads to the House. This week, Governor Tate Reeves announced that a special election will be held on April 21st to fill the vacancy in House District 88. Republican Ramona Blackledge of Jones County resigned just two weeks into her term amid pressure to choose between her state retirement benefits and her seat in the House. There are three other freshman Republican lawmakers in a similar predicament. House Speaker Philip Gunn tells MPB's Desiree Frazier why it's not right for lawmakers to draw their state pension while serving part-time in the legislature. Well, there's three reasons. One is it's the law. The second reason is it's the law. And the third reason is it's the law. And it's been the law for 70 years. There's a procedure for changing the law which I have encouraged them to, to do. They filed a bill and the committee soundly and roundly rejected it. It's been the law for 70 years. They are simply trying to circumvent the law. And that's the bottom line. They can be, offer any other kind of excuse that they want, but the bottom line is they have yet to explain how they propose to get around the law. And that's, that's it, that's the bottom line, it's that simple. Would you be willing to change the law? They, there have been bills filed for the last four years. I counted about eight that have been filed to change the law, including three or four this year that the committee took up last week, and all of them have died. The legislature is not willing to change the law. The public policy behind this is solid. It's good. It's in the best public interest for this to be the case. What they're trying to do is draw retirement and draw legislative pay. And we, the, the, the legislature for 70 years has said that's not a good idea. So it's that simple. It's just the law. The qualifying deadline for District 88's special election is March 2nd. If no candidate receives a majority of votes in the April 21st election, there will be a runoff on May 12th. Recent inmate on inmate violence in Mississippi's prisons and the deaths of at least 16 inmates have the Department of Corrections looking to move inmates out of a unit at Parchman where most of the violence occurred. The House Corrections Committee passed a bill requiring a detailed estimate of costs to repair and renovate the Walnut Grove Correctional Facility in Leake County. House Bill 756 allocates up to $50,000 to the Department of Finance and Administration for the study. Republican Kevin Horan of Grenada chairs the House Corrections Committee. He tells MPB's Desiree Fraser it's an option worth looking at. What we did today was look at the Walnut Grove facility and get some funding to get DFA to go down there and uh, assess it, determine what it's going to cost to get it upgraded so it can house just about any class of inmate. And that's basically what we got accomplished today in the committee. In that community, there have been uh, folks that have met and said that they don't want that facility reopened. Your thoughts on that? I don't know. I don't have any thoughts on that. That's just an option. That's a facility there uh, that needs to be looked at. And hopefully if uh, we decide to get it opened or the governor's office decides to open it, uh, they can work out any differences that they have down there in, in, the, in the area. And if they decide to open it, then maybe those things can get worked out. 
In a Senate corrections meeting, State Supreme Court Ju Chief Justice Michael Randolph said more intervention courts, including those for drug addictions, mental health and veterans issues, could reduce the number of people going to prison to begin with. He's asking for $2.1 million to create 19 new courts. If we expand the number of drug and alternative courts to also include mental health, because that's one problem is you've got a lot of people in parts who've got mental health problems uh, and shouldn't even be there. So to allow us to identify at the local level who those people are, and we can have great success like we've had in the drug courts because once people become accountable to a judge and to a group, they do well. They'll take their medications and they'll stay out of trouble. And then also for veterans. Again, I, I'm, I'm as a veteran of Vietnam War. Uh, I was also a veteran coming out of law school. I was in Navy JAG. Uh, uh, veterans have special issues, uh, and they're uh, health-related. Mental health and veterans' issues are illness issues. Drug courts are addiction issues. Just because a person's an addict doesn't necessarily need uh, the likelihood of their future success is going to be reduced if they go to parchment. If we get them in a drug court alternative, have them accountable, where they're going home taking care of their wife and kids, maintaining a job, getting uh, uh, twice a week, uh, paying for their own drug test, instead of me and you paying for them and had a better deal and send them off to parchment. So we can front load, uh, I don't want to say front load, actually, we're reducing the load that corrections gets to start with. Bradley Lum is CEO of the nonprofit Mississippi Prison Industries. He says recidivism in Mississippi is also a big issue. He told lawmakers that in fiscal year 2019, the state spent $48.18 to house one offender for one day. Now with about 19,000 offenders, he says it costs Mississippi taxpayers more than $900,000 every day. Lum believes the state could save more money by implementing more workforce training opportunities to make sure people leave prison as improved individuals. He tells MPB's Desiree Fraser that about 600 of the 19,000 inmates in the Department of Corrections are employed through his nonprofit and working in factories at four prison facilities across the state. So our guys are all inside, uh, in custody, uh, in, the, uh, in the custody of the Department of Corrections. Uh, they apply for uh, and receive opportunities to work for us inside our factories, inside and on the grounds uh, of, our state, uh, of our state prisons. Well, I'm confused because we're still hearing there is no workforce training. Well, you know, when you look at a population size of 20,000 inmates, right, and we have the capabilities at this point to employ roughly three and a half percent of that total population size. How many is that? About 550, 550 to 600. And so our total capabilities are somewhere probably around 650. Um, but look, you know, as I've said, and I believe wholeheartedly, we've got to grow that number. I mean, the reality is if we want to be serious about reentry opportunities, we got to grow that number to where 30 to 40 to 50 percent of our inmates have the opportunity to work. And uh, once that happens, we're going to start seeing that there's a work ethic being uh, instilled in our prison population that allows for them to not recidivate, to go out and, and, and get a job and, and, and ultimately have long-term sustainability. What type of jobs are available? Sure, so uh, we've got everything from a metal factory, we've got uh, garment shops, we've got a print factory, um, we've got all of kind of the trade skills that are out there and certainly we're looking at areas like carpentry that, that uh, we had shut down at one point, and now we're trying to revive that. We're looking at some pipe fitting opportunities with, uh, with in conjunction with folks like Ingalls and other uh, big, big companies that are out there. Uh, we're looking at, right now, even some software development opportunities. Democrat Juan Barnett chairs the Senate Corrections Committee. He says he supports the idea of expanding intervention courts to reduce the number of people entering prison and workforce training opportunities and facilities to reduce the number of ex-offenders returning to prison. He says he and other lawmakers will be introducing bills that address those reforms. There has to be something that we can do uh, preventively to keep from just sending everybody to prison. And, and I've been to a drug court uh, uh, um, graduation and I see the importance of it uh, from the individual to the family uh, it's very important and so 
if we could put some some monies in place to 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 take care of those things on the front end, of course that reduces the population rate. It's getting people back out to the real world where they need to be at working, and, it, and, and most of all, it restores the family. And these are drug free. So I mean, I'm all in favor of those things. We we have to have more workforce training. We do. Um, it's it's not you know. It's not to the best interest of that individual that's being released to not have some workforce training, not have some type of job skills, um, not to have everything that he or she needs when they when they get out. And, and you heard not only the judge, but the other gentleman also talk about, you know, um, documentation. And my thing is that I've been talking about since I've been here is that, you know, we need to make sure that these individuals who are working can make sure that these fines that's keeping them from having the most important documentation that they can have when they're released is a driver's license. They have to have this, and we need to make sure that we provide them with that so not only can they get out and go to work, but they can get out and actually go to work without having that fear of being pulled over, driving without a driver's license while they are honestly just trying to do the best that they can. So we need to make sure that all of these things are in place. And, and again, if we have to spend some monies today to ensure that, then I think it's money well spent in years to come. Officials with the Mississippi Department of Public Safety are asking for a hefty $55 million budget increase. Pat Cronin is with the agency's administrative operations. At a Senate Appropriations Committee budget hearing, he told lawmakers the department has seven divisions. He says they need funding for upgrades in the crime lab and more trooper schools to get more boots on the ground. Well, we're a big operation. We do a lot of things. The Department of Public Safety has a lot of tentacles that touch you know, every part of the state of Mississippi. It's not just the highway patrol, it's the crime labs, the Bureau of Narcotics, and it's uh, public safety planning. It's a law enforcement officers training academy. When you look at the big picture, uh, we have some significant needs. We had to send over 100 troopers just a couple weeks ago uh, for a 14 day stay at the Department of Corrections at Parchman, and that cost us about half a million dollars just for that alone. When those hundred troopers go to quell this insurrection that we have up there, then we have to backfill with another hundred troopers, which puts us in an overtime situation. So it's a very complicated issue when you talk about DPS and the different divisions in it. Uh, we're, we're, we're concerned with public safety, every aspect of it. Senator Briggs Hobson of Vicksburg chairs the Appropriations Committee. He says it's too soon to prioritize all the requests. Last year, the Department of Public Safety received $102 million. At least on the Senate side, we've already increased the state teacher pay by $1,000, which is about a $52 million uh, increase to the budget. And that's a recurring expense, so it's not just this year. It'll be every year thereafter. Uh, that's certainly a big uh, portion of the budget, an increased portion. Uh, we're going to be looking at things like DPS and corrections. Again, like you said, still waiting on some of the information in corrections because that's a very fluid situation. Uh, hopefully, after we hear from them, uh, those areas, uh, I think you may have been in on the mental health hearings and health Department of Health hearings, uh, not to mention IHL and community colleges. Um, a lot of people with a lot of requests. I think there are probably over a billion dollars worth of additional requests on top of uh, the funds that were allocated and appropriated last year. Uh, so there's a lot to look at, and obviously we got to pick and prioritize the things that are important. Uh, not everybody's going to get increased budgets, um, but we're going to see what we can do to make it the best. And, and the ideal here is to get the services to the citizens of the state. So let's get straight to the point now with views from both sides of the aisle. Brandon Jones is an attorney and former Democratic member of the House. Austin Barber is a national Republican strategist and founder of the Clearwater Group. Austin, Brandon, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thanks, Wilson. Let's start with uh, corrections. Austin, do you think that uh, legislators are on the right track, and in particular with respect to looking at Walnut Grove as a possible, uh, as reopening it as a possible place to put some inmates? Yeah, Governor Reeves said this week, I think that I read that um, Walnut Grove is just more and more a, a real serious option to to move certain prisoners from Parchman Unit 29, and some. And I'm assuming there's probably some other areas in Parchman that that um, need work. You know, just have gotten out of date, and they need a a better uh, environment to move some of these prisoners to. So it looks like that's you know, there's a prison there. It's it's not being occupied. Uh, it certainly has been used in the past. 
And if that's what uh, corrections officers and, and our government officials think is the best option from a cost efficiency standpoint, as well as, as, well as a standpoint to place prisoners in a safe uh, and you know, healthy environment f for them, because that's important too, uh, then I think that's the smart move. Yeah, we've all heard about Unit 29 at Parchman and, and it just being terrible. They, they have to shut it down. There's, there's really no rehabilitating that unit, and, and Unit 30 is pretty close behind. And so uh, there has to be a better answer than that. Walnut Grove, from a facility standpoint, is in much better shape. And as we heard from the Department of Finance and Administration, the state only has to work through some, some debt issues, and then Mississippi is the full owner of it. And so. I'm sure there will be questions about how it's uh, overseen and, and how some of that works out, but in terms of it being a facility that's a better option than Parchman Unit 29 and 30, I don't think there's any question. But, you know, we also heard this week from Cliff Johnson from the MacArthur Justice Center that if we're looking at this solely from a bricks and mortar standpoint, we're probably not going to get where we have to go. And I think he's right about that. If we don't do something about our over incarceration problem, I think Mississippi is going to have significant challenges that just continue to grow as we're seeing in Alabama. So he urged lawmakers to consider Senate Bill 2321, which is a bill that would restore parole eligibility to folks who would have had it prior to the changes that took place in the 90s. And then to also take a look at our habitual statutes. You know, we, we're just locking the door and throwing away the key all too often and so to create some incentive for prisoners to rehabilitate themselves and to look at their life and, and job opportunities as we heard others talk about earlier in the program that has to be part of the equation as well. Yeah certainly even going back to last year um, leadership under Republican leaders and it's a bipartisan issue they're not just thinking about bricks and mortar they're thinking about how do we ensure that we have less people in jail and that most importantly we have a place where we can put people who are violent criminals and then for the ones that are ready to re-enter society let's make sure that they're able to re-enter society as successfully as they possibly can. You know it's, it's not a bad thing that we're having this conversation in such a broad ranging way. I mean you have folks from the uh, Department of Corrections, you have folks from the legislature, but you also have community partners and, and, and people like family members of people who are incarcerated. So it's a good conversation to have. I agree. So with the Senate bill regarding uh, TANF funds uh, and the uh, this bill would make the uh, uh, would give the state auditor the authority to look at the tax returns of someone who's receiving tenant funds. Brandon, I take it you're, you're not in favor of this. Well, yeah, it feels a little bit like a solution in search of a problem. It was almost like the committee said, we heard TANF was in the news this week, just give me anything that goes to that. It, this is not responsive at all to where we've heard of benefits in the news lately, which had to do with contractors that were in, allegedly embezzling funds. So I just the timing of this seems very odd. It's an odd choreography that the week after that, you roll out a bill that says all tax returns can be examined in this process. Not only is that kind of, as you heard Senator Horn say, it seems to target the very most vulnerable people that apply for these funds, it also adds another layer of bureaucracy to the process. We already know that Mississippi rejects people who seek these funds at a higher rate than almost any state, now we're adding another piece to that puzzle. Yeah, I think very simply it's, it's this. The federal government puts $5 billion a year into Medicaid in Mississippi. This is a directive from OMB at the federal level to our state auditor and our state legislators and our state leaders of, listen, we want to sample a small percentage, I think it's 5% is what I was told, of recipients, whether they are individuals or whether they are providers. And certainly providers, you should probably have a higher percentage of that, like every single one of them. Right. And we want to look at their state tax returns. I don't, I don't, I'm not an expert on this, but I don't think that means that an individual who's getting TANF funds or any any of the other dozens of programs that they have at Medicaid are going to have to go figure out where do I get my tax return and give it to Medicaid. This is all going to be done behind scenes. And if there is an issue with, wait a minute, you're not really eligible for this program. Maybe we can put you in another program or you shouldn't be on any programs. I, I, I'm, I, I do not have a problem with that. But I, I certainly understand. Let's, let's make sure that we look at the providers as well. But looking at individuals, they, they need to be eligible. I get that. I understand that. Let's cut out fraud, waste, and abuse, which has always been a mantra. 
uh, from Republicans for, for generations. There's some rumblings in the Capitol of uh, making some changes with the institutions of higher learning. It's gotten more interest now because uh, IHL is currently uh, has launched a search committee to find a new president for Jackson State University. We recently uh, had the selection of, of Glenn Boyce at, at Ole Miss. Uh, Austin, what do you know about efforts to, to change the way that process is done and how do you feel about them? Well, listen, I, I, there's no question that um, alumni leaders, uh, community leaders um, of Ole Miss, Mississippi State, Jackson State, you name it, Southern Miss, they want to have more influence in the process. They want to be more involved in the process. Um, there's some that have been frustrated by you know, several of the last hires. I know mm -hmm. a lot of people that are on IHL. They're great people. They care about the universities that they graduated from and, and the other universities in our state. But I, I think this is, there's no question that this is sentiment from alumni from around the state who said, listen, maybe we shouldn't go get rid of IHL. There's a lot of stuff right now, ideas that are being thrown up against the wall. But we want to have our university, whatever university they represent, have more influence in this process. And we want to be able to have more recommendations and influence of who our next leader of our university should be. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know of anybody over there, Wilson, that's clamoring for the IHL or coming to their defense. I don't see IHL T-shirts going around. Um, I think there are a lot of institutions that are kind of uh, curious about this. But I think we can all agree some oversight is helpful. And Austin, before I prattle on about this, because we'll have another chance to talk about it, I think you've got a special viewer that you want us to give a yeah, message I, to. I, yeah, I appreciate that, Brandon. I certainly want to say happy birthday uh, to Sam Olden. He's 100 years old. I think he had a recent birthday. This is a man from Yazoo City, a great American, a man who served his country, and someone who was uh, a big influence to me as I was a little boy growing up in Yazoo City. And, and he's an avid viewer. So, Sam Olden, happy birthday, and great to great to know you're an avid viewer here. Absolutely. Our show. We enjoy viewers at any age, but at 100 to be choosing us, that's, uh, that's terrific. So, you don't think we should get rid of AHL? we were saying yeah I, I don't I don't <laughs> think that um, we what we I don't think we can afford to do away with any oversight I mean we're talking about a lot of funds we're talking about a lot of decisions and so I think there has to be some infrastructure in place but I, I, I do think this will be an ongoing conversation especially as more institutions are added to the list of those who are no frustrated with outcomes and yeah. it seems that a lot of the uh, students and and, and uh, stakeholders just want to have more say in the process in particular of finding their presidents and we'll uh, see how that yeah. debate uh, shakes out here in the coming uh, weeks and months. Thank you both, general, gentlemen, for, uh, for joining us. And uh, we thank you for joining us as well. We're out of time. Don't forget, you can watch this program online at mpbonline.org slash issue. And for day-to-day -day coverage, follow MPB News on Twitter and Facebook and listen to Morning Edition on MPB Think Radio weekdays at 8.30. We're glad you were with us tonight. We hope you have a good one. Thanks for listening to the At Issue podcast from MPB News. If you haven't already, subscribe to get new episodes weekly. And don't forget to like, rate, and leave a review. You can also stay in touch with MPB News on Twitter and Facebook. For daily news, check out the Mississippi Edition podcast. Thanks for listening.